and thank you for joining me on this free Label View training webinar. Now, this webinar is uh, really just to help you get up and running with the Label View software. We're going to start with the new Label Document Wizard that's going to walk us through uh, adding the internal drivers in the software as well as setting up the label template itself, height, width, margins. Uh, we're also going to take a look at getting objects on the label, objects like text fields, barcodes, images, uh, as well as a few shapes and how to align all of those. Now to get started, I'm going to load up a uh, new label template. We can click on the new button up at the top of the ribbon here. We're going to see the new label document wizard pop up. Right away, we have three options, use current printer, uh, native printer, and Windows printer. Current printer, just what it sounds like, it's the default printer. Native printer is one of our internal drivers and Windows printer is going to pull from the list of your devices and printers. So anything, uh, anything showing up in your control panel devices and printers, the software is just pulling directly from there. Now the native printer is uh, it's an embedded driver in LabelView, so you don't need to go out to you know, a printer manufacturer's website and download their driver or use the CD that comes with the printer. We have quite a few of the printers uh, embedded in our software. We have about 2,900 of these. They're all thermal transfer, direct thermal printers. Uh, we do recommend you use the native printer. You get more of a WYSIWYG print. There's also some added features in the software when you're using the native printer, and I'll point those out when we go through those sections throughout the webinars. It's very simple to add one of these native printers. Uh, you just click the Add Printer button, a little Add Printer window pops up, and from here, it's really just manufacturer, model, and port. We have a scrolling list of all the different manufacturers. You can expand these, select one of the models, and on the right is the port, how that printer is connected to the workstation. So we have a scrolling list of the local ports, COM ports, LPT ports, USB ports, things like that. Uh, below that, we have network printers. Maybe you're using a UNC path, the shared printer out on your network. Uh, below that is the TCIP option. I'm sorry, TCP IP option. Uh, so maybe the printer itself has an IP address. You can type in the IP address here, click OK, and it will add it to the scrolling window. And then below that, you have the option to create a new port. Now you wanna keep in mind that the network printers button and create new port button, uh, they will be grayed out unless you launch the software as administrator. But at the end of the day, it's just manufacturer model and ports. You click OK, and it will add it to this list. So choose any one of these, click Next, and now we're selecting the label stock. So we have two options in here. We have custom stock and predefined stock. Uh, we have quite a few of the predefined stocks in here, some from Avery and Brady and so forth and so on. Uh, if you're not finding your type or name of stock, or if you're not sure what it is, or it's a completely customized stock, you wanna choose the use custom stock radio button. In fact, that's what we're gonna use for this webinar, just so we can see the rest of the windows in here. You can input a unique type and name. So at the very end of this wizard, you have the option to save the settings to the predefined stock list, and you won't have to go through this again. You click Next. Here we're putting the label dimensions. Now you want to peel off the label from the roller from the sheet and use these dimensions. You don't want to include uh, any part of the roller of the sheet. So we have width, height, corner roundness. This is just how rounded the corners are. Uh, the higher the number, uh, the more rounded the corner until it's essentially a circular label. And then how many going across and how many going down. You'll see that update in the preview. Now, if you're putting to a roll of labels, you'll want to keep it at one by one unless you're putting to an actual sheet with multiple labels on it. Click Next. Now we have the page properties. So if you're putting to a sheet, again, with multiple labels on it, this will be the sheet width and height. It's going to be grayed out if you have automatic sizing based on label dimensions checked. Uh, same with margins, any applicable margins for the page you'll put in here. Now, again, if you're printing to a roll of labels, you can pretty much bypass these just by checking off automatic sizing as well as printer default. The last thing you need to worry about is the media type down here. This is going to tie into a roll of labels. We have three options in here, with gap, continuous, and marked. If there's a gap between your labels on the roll, generally it's about an eighth of an inch, you'll choose with gap. No gap, you'll choose continuous. And uh, if you flip the roll over, if it looks like there is a little black uh, Sharpie mark on the bottom side of your roll, you'll choose marked. Click next, we have the option to include a background image. Uh, maybe your marketing department has uh, given you a, an image of what the label should look like. You can place that in the background and build on top of it. It can be pretty useful. And if we click next, last page in here is just a summary of what we've selected. It's a pretty generic four by six inch label. Theoretically, it's on a roll. 
And again, at the very bottom, we have the option to save stock selection so that it shows up in the predefined stock list. Click finish, we're out of the wizard. We have our driver selected. We have our label template set up and we can start adding objects onto this label. All the objects we'll be adding are going to come from this left-hand toolbar. It's the object selection toolbar. We're just gonna start with this uppercase T and kind of work our way down. Now, if we click on that T, that's for text fields, text generation, we'll click on that, see the cursor update. Click on a blank part of the label. And we get the new text object wizard to pop up. So right away, it prompts us for a data source. We're gonna keep that at fixed data. So we're gonna be dealing with all constant information, no variables. Uh, that's gonna be for the uh, basic and advanced webinars. Below that is the text we want to show up on the label. Oops. There we go. And below that is a summary of the font style and alignment. And if we click next, we'll be able to adjust those. So we can see a scrolling list of all the fonts available. To the right of that, we see the font size. To the right of that, we see the, uh, the size width, how wide or narrow that font is. Uh, we have foreground color, background color, and lastly, style, whether it's bold, italicized, or underlined. Now, word on the fonts, we have two broad subcategories of fonts. We have graphical fonts and printer resident fonts. Uh, graphical fonts are gonna be the more popular, Arial, Times New Roman, Helvetica, uh, Courier, things of that nature. Um, they're all pulling from the Windows fonts directory. So if you ever need a new font uh, to show up in the software or placed on your labels, uh, you can download that, place it in the, uh, the Windows fonts directory, which uh, for every Windows operating system, it should be C Windows fonts. Um, you can place in that directory, close down the software, reopen it, it's going to show up in the graphical subcategory. Uh, the printer resident fonts, uh, quite a few less of these, these are loaded on the printer itself, not the PC. So what does all that really mean? Uh, when you're using a graphical font, more data is sent to the printer. When you're using a printer resident font, uh, <laughs> printer resident font, less data is sent to the printer. So if you start to see things like um, your printer will print label and pause, print label and pause, print label and pause, um, it's possible that you're overloading the printer's buffer memory because maybe you're doing some huge batch jobs, thousands of labels at a print, 24/7 uh, printing, heavily populated label templates, things like that. Uh, and you just cannot have that pause between prints, will start to lessen the amount of data going to that printer. And usually one of the first things we'll do is uh, try to switch over from graphical fonts to print resident fonts. Clicking next, we can change the alignment, whether it's left, centered, right, or justified. The line spacing, you're typing enough data where it's gonna jump down to a second line. This is the space between the two lines is based on a percentage of the font height. You can change the rotation, Enable word wrap or fit to frame. Uh, word wrap is if you're typing enough data where it's gonna go outside of the frame, it will just automatically jump down to a second line rather than just keep going to the right. Uh, fit to frame's a little bit different in that it's going to place anchor points around the corners of the text object. You can click and drag those anchor points, uh, making it uh, bigger or smaller. You wanna keep in mind that the font size is going to auto adjust at that point to try to fill up the entirety of the frame. So if I stretch this to be the full four by six inches of the label, my phrase, hello world, is gonna to try to take up the entirety of the label template. Alternatively, I could type in a short novel. Uh, it's still gonna fill in the label, but the font size is going to auto adjust to be very, very small. And lastly, we can change the X, Y coordinates of the field, and that's gonna be based on the anchor point up in the top left of the object. Clicking finish, we have our phrase, hello world, on the label. Now we did go through quite a few windows just to get two words on this label. We can bypass that wizard, make it a little bit quicker for you. You click on text generation, uh, we'll see the cursor update. And if you hold the shift key and then click on the label, we'll bypass the wizard. You just have a text box that you can start typing in. Makes things a little bit quicker. Uh, one last thing on uh, uh, text objects before we move on. Uh, let's say you have about 20 more to add to the label, but they uh, they should be a little bit smaller. Somehow they should be different. It might be the, the font itself or the font size or the style. Uh, you can set up one text object you, the way you want it to be set up. Uh, maybe you want to change the font size. And if you right click on this object, choose set as default, every other text object we add will match this font font size and font style. Next object we're gonna take a look at is barcodes. So we're gonna click on the barcode 
generation button, we'll see that cursor update. Click on blank part of the label. Now we have the new barcode object wizard. Again, we're going to keep the data source at fixed data, but below that we have the barcode data. This is what's being encoded into the barcode. So when I scan this, it will result in one through nine. Below that we have a check digit. This is going to take all of the barcode data, place it through an algorithm, and then display a last character. So I just have nine characters in barcode data, but when we scan it, it will actually display 10 characters if we choose a, uh, a check digit. To the right of that, we have human readable. This is just the readable part below the linear barcode. Uh, we have three options in here, none, default, custom. Uh, none is going to remove the human readable entirely. Default is just bottom centered. Custom is going to make it a free flowing field. Now to the left of this, we have the symbologies, the different barcode symbologies. Um, each one of these is just a little bit different. Um, some allow strictly numbers, some allow for numbers and letters, some allow numbers and letters and special characters, some allow numbers and letters and special characters and uh, you know ASCII characters. Um, some absolutely require a check digit. So right now I have code 39 selected, we have the option for none or one digit. Some lock you into one digit because it's an industry standard. So each one's a little bit different. Uh, if you want to read about the symbology itself, uh, see what can be encoded into the symbology, you can just hover your mouse over the barcode symbology, click on the symbology information button. You'll see a little blurb about the information uh, as well as what can be encoded into that barcode. It's uh, pretty easy to tell uh, if you aren't meeting the requirements, uh, you'll see the preview gray out. There's gonna be a red border around the barcode data as well. Now this is a UPCA that I selected. It absolutely requires 12 characters, so we'll add a few more in there and then we'll see it get generated. Click next. We can change the rotation of the barcode, the X, Y coordinates again. Uh, the bar width dots, essentially the, uh, the mil spec ratio of the barcode. And lastly, the bar height. And if we click finish, we're all set and our barcode is on the label. Next object we'll be adding is images. This one's gonna be pretty straightforward. Again, keeping data source at fixed data. Right away, uh, right away, we have a few options in here. We have a few uh, sample uh, folders and galleries to choose from. These are all included with label view. Uh, hazardous material, GHS, uh, uh, signal warning, safety signs, things of that nature. Now, if you have your own directory with your own images, you can certainly use that. You just click on the browse button, browse out to your own directory. Any images in the directory will be populated here. You just highlight your image and really at that point you can click finish and you're all set. Uh, if you want, you can click next, uh, change some of the image properties. You can adjust the brightness, contrast, gamma, uh, make it a negative, flip it horizon horizontally or vertically, put it through a filter, change the color palette and the reduction method. Uh, also, if you click next, you can change the rotation, stretch mode, whether it's zoomed in or not, and again, the X, Y coordinates. But otherwise, you can just click finish and your image is on the label. A few other shapes we can add. We can add straight lines, squares and rectangles, circle and ellipse. Uh, we can add polygons. Each click on a polygon is going to be a different angle. Uh, we can add oblique lines and lastly, rounded rectangles. Now each one of these shapes that I just added, we can double click on there, uh, increase or decrease the size of the line. We can also fill in uh, some of these objects with a solid color. Last thing we're gonna go through is alignment. Let me create a bit of room on this label. I'm gonna add two more text fields just so we can better see the alignment features. Now there are two methods for alignment within label view. I really like to break it down. Um, would you like to go through alignment uh, before or after you've placed the objects on the label? So maybe you have a database connection, uh, which we'll go through in uh, some of the later webinars, or maybe you have a number of when printed variables. Uh, you can get all of those objects on the label and then go through alignment. Now, if you need to do, uh, if you'd like to do that, 
before you go through the alignment, the object does need to be highlighted. So you can just left click on one of the objects. If you wanna skip a few, you can hold the shift key and highlight the next objects. So now we have two objects highlighted. Alternatively, you can hold the left click on the mouse, create a border, anything encapsulated by the border. When you let go of that left click is gonna be highlighted. So now that we have some objects highlighted, we can select the object drop down highlight alignment and we will see all of the alignment features. For the most part, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, things like left aligning, right aligning, top alignment, bottom alignment, uh, really does clean up the label. Uh, one of the more unique ones that, uh, as I said, really clean up the label is the equalize the horizontal and vertical spacing. So if we choose uh, vertical spacing, the space in between each object is going to be equidistant. So again, really cleans up the label. The next option for alignment is if you would like to go through alignment as you're designing the label, as you're placing the objects on the label. Um, this is going to display a grid in the background of the label template. Everything is going to snap to that grid using its anchor point. And again, that anchor point is in the top left of the object. Now the grid's not enabled by default. It's pretty easy to uh, display that. We would choose the tools dropdown, select configuration, jump over to the grid tab, as we can see, it's disabled. We can switch that to eighth of an inch. Uh, we can choose to display it. If we click OK, we'll see a grid in the background of the label. And all these objects will now snap to that grid. Now, if you want to go back to having the um, no grid where the fields are a little bit more free flowing, they're not snapping to that grid, it's very easy to disable that. Again, you just go to Tools, select Configuration, jump back over to the Grid tab, choose None, click OK and that removes the grid from the background. Now that's all the information we're covering for this uh, Label View free webinar. Um, I hope this really helps you get up and running with the software with some pretty uh, simple labels. I hope to see you for the basic and advanced webinars.